What's up, guys? Welcome back to Muscle Minds with Dr. Scott Stevenson. I'm Scott McNally. Our programming is brought to you by truenutrition.com. You can use our code ADVICES for some additional savings, high-quality supplements. If you're a bodybuilder, they've got stuff you need flat out. All sorts of stuff from pre-workouts, intra-workouts, post-workouts, protein, and more. Plus, of course, we're sponsored by uh, GetAzoff.com. And you can use the code either at the Amazon or at the website to uh, get 10% off Advices 10. Guys, we have a, a thread over at the Advices group. If you're not a member, by the way, head on over. I know Facebook isn't like the the hub that it used to be in life. Um, but you can head over to Facebook. We have a group there. It's a good place where you know like-minded people who listen to the shows can get together. We have question thread threads there. We post up you know different shows that are coming up, shows that have happened. Plus, we post the live stuff too. So if you guys want to watch us live, you can go there. I'm looking at a question from uh, Brandon Goldberg right now. Oh no, I'm not. That's actually a drugs and stuff <laughs> question. I have to keep scrolling up. Here it is. This is from Brian. He says, "What's up, guys? Question from Muscle Minds. I'd really like to hear." Dr. Scott's input. Um, should one perform static stretching on a muscle part on a muscle part the day after it's been trained, or would that impair muscle recovery? Uh, would those static stretches not affect the muscle tissue in the same way as load damage, um, or would they, uh, even though they are a different type of stimulus to the muscle? Um, I ask because I'm constantly trying to correct forward shoulder and head uh, posterior problems. Um, I typically will stretch my pecs and delts on a daily basis, but I'm wondering if uh, post-chest training days should be avoided. Uh, I didn't see that second part of the question, so let me go take a look at that because that's important. Um, I'll start addressing it though while I look it up. Okay. So... Uh, some of this depends on how aggressive the stretching is. So if you're going bonkers, you know, with stretching, um, that could possibly impair performance. Yeah. One of the things that happens, and he sort of, this is why I want to make sure I'm on that. Let me see if I can find that here. Question. Maybe even if you just bump that up, Scott, I could find it. Oh, but right. one of, yeah, I'll do that. One right. of the things that, I'm, I'm looking here. I'm getting close. One of the things that happens because people are sitting at their desks all the time and people who especially are sort of desk bound. How about people are. that are on their microphones and like, lean yeah, hunching this, for on their, or just on their phones. Sure. Sure. You know, typing and um, just all of this. Ah, okay. So he posted this twice then. Cause this is, I think this is something different anyway. Okay. Um, constant correct shoulder and head postural problems. Yeah. So a couple, couple things here. There's, th for instance, um, putting a muscle on stretch will prevent any atrophy oh. that can happen. For instance, when it's been, um, or not any, but to a large extent, it will prevent um, more than 50% in most cases, most studies that I've looked at when they cast. For instance, you have your arm cast at 90 degrees if you've had um, you know, some sort of a biceps injury or what have you. Um, or just if just the arm is casted for whatever reason, let's say it's some sort of a, a surgery on the bones, the, the triceps because it's under stretch, yeah, um, is gonna is gonna uh, atrophy less than the biceps. I'll be damned! I didn't know that. Um, yeah, I was talking to someone the other day. Actually, he posted sort of about this on Facebook, and you see in um, people with spinal cord injuries, mm -hmm. a lot of times um, it depends on what they do with their spasticity. Um, medications. So a lot of times they'll take anti-spasticity medication, so they don't get cramps all the time. Like literally, they'll mm -hmm. they'll get this phenomenon, like it's called clonus, where it's sort of like this reverberating, um, self feed forwarding type of spasticity, where their legs will just start going like this. The, yeah. the 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 plantar flexion of the calf will push their leg up if they're sitting in a chair, yeah. and then it'll come back down, and then you get a stretch reflex, and the leg will just go bouncing up and down like that. <laughs> they'll have to push it out, like dampen it it's a pain in the ass for I some people it. yeah but it also prevents some atrophy because it gives you muscle contractions okay. so the disuse isn't as big but for people who do use those um those meds if they if you look at the atrophy in the legs you'll see it you know pretty widespread but a lot of times they'll sit with their feet plantar flex so their toes pointed yeah. and the anterior tibialis so the front of the shin um that muscle won't atrophy nearly as much huh so one of the things that I try to do myself is, is stretch my pecs 
because I'm sitting at my desk as much yeah. as possible. Yeah. Um, so also, and I've mentioned this before, I think I've covered some of this information in a previous question. I know I have. But you're setting up the resting muscle length, um, meaning, you know, what, what is, the, what is the, the way in which the actin and myosin overlaps, how the connective tissue um, is basically creating the, the larger structure of the muscle, the fascia, yeah. by what your, what, your, what your posture is. Okay. So imagine if, imagine if you know, <clears throat> just to kind of forget about the idea of atrophy, you were always seated. So your hip flexors were always shortened. Yeah. So and you you sat that way for even just a week, you would be really tight getting back up. And if you sat that way for months or for years, as some people do, then that connective tissue is going to model itself mm. around that resting length to some degree. Yeah. So if you take a muscle like just imagine you know the biceps that's shortened or the, the pec muscles that are in this sort of shortened position because you're slumping your shoulders forward. Yeah. Then you're you're basically setting up the muscle to be smaller because yeah. you're, you're you're everything shortened and it's not going to be it's it's just not going to be have the same volume as if you had it in a stretch position. So the wow. the casting and like that example with the spinal cord injury all demonstrate that. Huh. So there's something about stretch and setting up that that um I mean just think of it this way. Imagine you've got a fiber that's this long. Yeah. Um, and then you you just shorten it chronically to that long. Right. What's going to happen is it's going to set up the actin and myosin and those little sarcomeres that run the length of the fiber. So that those are at pretty close to optimal overlap yeah. along the length of the fiber at that shortened position. That means it's going to mean less actin and myosin because a, um, a, a sarcomere is a standardized length. So maybe, this isn't an accurate number, but let's say it's 10 sarcomeres here. And it's seven sarcomeres here, but if you're in a, if you're chronically in a stretch, it might be twelve sarcomeres. Oh wow! Okay, so that's a huge difference in the amount of, of of simple contractile material you'll have. Yeah. So there's that. Um, the stretching is probably a good idea because there's actually a study where they looked at some of those effects of casting in mice, and they they um, they had various different um, uh, groups that they used for this, but they wanted to figure out like what was the minimal amount of activity during the course of what was otherwise in a mobilization mm-hmm. paradigm model um, to prevent some of that from happening. I, it was like 30 minutes over the course of a day. Okay. So they would take, they would, they had these little mice and they would, they cast their leg and then they would take, they would knock them out and take the cast off so they could just do some passive stretching, just wiggle their leg around back and forth for half an hour a day. So that's, you know, that's a half an hour out of a 24 hour day which is like, you know, like 4% of the day or something like that. Mm-hmm. Roughly, I guess. Is that right? Yeah. 8% of the day. Okay. You know, 4%. Yeah. Really my, something like that. It's a very small percentage. Yeah. So you can undo, um, you can undo that uh, shortening effect just by doing some amount of stretching. You can do it periodically hmm. um, throughout the day. But if you start doing things like, like leaning up against the door and doing the door stretch for mm-hmm. your pecs, mm-hmm. you know, then, then you could possibly, if you're really going after it, um, create an impairment potentially an impairment. on your recovery. Oh, okay. So of you your mean, recovery. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. You mean that would like, actually be like tearing more fibers down. Possibly. Yeah. Po- possibly. I mean, if you really like, if you went like, Oh, just go to my home gym and I'll grab the, grab the dumbbells and do like, you know, a, you know, 60 or 90 second extreme stretch, yeah. all the DC training. Yeah. yeah, that would that would then be um, another stimulus for muscle growth. It would be like adding, in, in a sense, adding a, a load stimulus, like another mini training session. Yeah. He's probably, Brian's probably not doing that, I'm guessing. But without a doubt, like the, a passive stretch that's like not, not horribly painful is a good idea. Um, and also, too, and we, we were talked about this a little bit in, in our conversation. We kind of like we're heading towards the topic of if you set yourself up to have good flexibility, it gives you a, a larger ra- active range of motion okay. just around the joint. And it just gives you more degrees of freedom. Mm. So if you're doing like, for instance, a pec fly yeah. where you might tend to have a tear when you're in that really stretched position yeah. and your pecs are really short – um, you're, if you get down to that position where they're used to being, 
you could be at sort of your end range of motion mm. and and you could you could potentially cause a muscle injury because that everything's tight there because you haven't been stretching it yeah. so that the 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 whole idea like the literature is not really doesn't strongly point to the idea of of stretching being the greatest preventative although some studies have demonstrated this for for um uh injuries it's not a bad idea in my opinion so um as long as you don't overdo it now what about um what about stretching it, it, while we're talking about it the first thing i think of now is that i i'm terrible with stretching and it's it's something that I forget when I say I'm terrible with it. It's something that I forget to add in. Um, mm. But I do I do like to add it in. Um, you know, having seen like the DC stretches, and then having seen other people incorporate them that I've worked out with or people that I've respected that have suggested you know adding stretches in, maybe at the end of a workout. Um, now that how how beneficial do you find stretching to be for for growth? Well, it's a part of fortitude training. It's the part that people forget the most, <laughs> pretty much. It's the part that's really sort of funny when we go and I do a fortitude training camp and we go into the gym. Yeah. And like, we'll, a lot of times we'll just start with legs because everyone's kind of fresh after the morning lecture, gets everyone going. Okay. And then you do the stretches. <laughs> and people have to do them like, holy, when I show them how I would typically have people do the stretch, they're like, holy shit. Yeah. And people who have been doing say, often say, like, this is the worst part of the training. Does it make that much of a difference in, in your results? I, I like for for instance, one thing that one that I noticed, and the main effect was in starting to do them for the first time because of the novelty of it. But this was way back in the DC training days. Yeah. So one of the things people will say, and here's kind of my explanation for that, is that stretching creates better muscle separation. Okay. Um, it's like, okay, how's that happening? Well, that's something you can see in the quads. And so imagine you've done your quad training, your squatting, what have you, and you, and you maybe typically don't, um, have a whole lot of rectus femoris activation. Okay. Um, and maybe you don't do a lot of leg lifts or sit up type, um, movements where you've got the rectus femoris, which is a hip flexor getting trained sort of indirectly during those movements. So the, 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 the two of the big things about resistance exercise that makes it a good stimulus for growth is the tension okay. and potentially the metabolic stress. And that's a whole other topic that's really kind of fascinating. But you can you can have low tension and create metabolic stress with blood flow restriction and get muscle growth. Mm. Um, there's still some nuances there that you know maybe we can talk talk about later. But so those things are important and you can and you can grow from isometric contractions. Yeah. Um, and you can grow uh, um, something about stretch is also important. In and of itself, there's the, there's the stretch overload model, which with quail that Dante used to talk about all the time, which is it's sort of a, st a stretch, pun intended, to say that that uh, that body of literature is directly applicable because that's like a 24 hour around the clock load on the muscle that was growing in those quail, okay. which is very different than doing a 90 second extreme stretch. Yeah, but take go back to the person who's just trained their legs. And now they do a quad stretch. You know the, the quad stretch, you just kind of reach back behind your your um, your back and you grab your ankle? Yeah, yeah. Pull your, yeah. Well, I would have people do that usually either on a bench or find um, like the round pads that you see on like a lot of pull-down machines to hold your legs down under. Yeah, yeah. Put your foot up on top of a pad like that. Okay. And then sink down so you get the knee flexion, so your heel's on your butt, and then drive your hips forward. Oh, wow. So that stretches the quad. Yeah. And that stretches the rectus femoris and the hip flexors too. Sure. And for someone who's never done that before, um, especially that kind of stretch, and you've done that, I would call this in my training system an occlusion stretch. So you you get into that stretch position and you've got a good pump. And once you're in that position, the muscle is, is so full anyway, yeah. you're not getting any blood flow in there, just probably from the stretch in and of itself. But that you then you superimpose upon that a voluntary contraction yeah. and you keep trying to deepen the stretch as you go. So that rectus femoris now is being stretched as because it crosses the knee and it's being stretched because you're driving your hips forward, yeah. pulling the hips in a hip extension, which stretches the, the hip flexor. In this case, we're talking about the rectus femoris. That muscle will burn like a mofo mm. if you haven't been doing those at all, like freaking crazy. And it will, and it produces growth there. So, oh. 
now go back to this idea of separation in the quad yeah. as an example is you've got the medialis on the inside, lateralis on the outside, and the rectus femoris is right in between, mm-hmm. and the muscles kind of come here, and the rectus femoris is kind of this mound in between them. Right. So imagine you the, the, the medialis and the lateralis are here, and then you've got just kind of a flat little rectus femoris because it's not developed. Yeah. And now you make it more developed so it's bigger and rounder. More separation. Well, that crevice yeah. in between muscles is what gives us the notion of separation. Yeah. You can see the separate between the muscles. Yeah, yeah. Because you develop them more fully. Huh, Okay. So that's like the kind of the most obvious example of this, but take, take any muscle that you learn how to stretch and the things that I would say, like, you know, like when Dave and I, we did a lot of these stretches and you kind of have to, we would try to encourage each other, Dave Henry, when we were doing DC training together. Yes. Um, and I would tell people this, who I've trained with the fortitude training is now it gives you the, ch- you've got different options with the stretch, but let's say you did a lot of like lower pec training that day because fortitude training is. It's a high frequency, so the volume of each workout isn't tremendous. So you may not have hit the entire muscle, you know, with mm. 19 different exercises the way some people would do. They want to get everything all at once. Right. You, so you may sense when you go into that stretch that you don't didn't get as much upper pec as you wanted to, or you just really didn't target the lower pec as much as you want. You still got something there. Yeah. Well, you when you go into that stretch, and either you use a load in some way, so like if it were a lower pec. You could like load up a dip belt and go into a deep stretch on a dip yeah. um, setup, um, or or use a decline bar like in a in a power rack where the safeties are set up so you can go down low and then just roll it you know up out of the way so you don't you know end up choking yourself out with the bar right. when you're done. But that would be an extreme stretch, or simply like get into like a power rack or a doorway and stretch at the angle at your shoulder that hits that lower pec, and then you contract that uh, muscle. Yeah. The first is an extreme stretch, what Dante called them. I just use the same same term, terminology. The other one I call an occlusion stretch. You're creating an occlusion effect with the stretch, which has a superimposed contraction on it. Hmm. And now you've got a chance to, we, we might talk about mind-muscle connection if we get to it today, but now you have a chance to deepen that mind-muscle connection. Yeah as well as hit the muscle where, in ways that you might have missed hmm. um, with those. So you can tell, like, I got a little bit left there. I just didn't absolutely destroy my lower pec. Okay. And that was kind of what I wanted to do today with the exercises I chose. So you can go after it yeah. even more so. Or if you, if you got the lower pec and you feel like you need more upper pec, which almost everyone does, yeah. then you just change the angle of the stretch. You do it instinctively, huh. and then you contract there. So it's a way to add variety to your training, both in terms of how the muscle is hit, so to speak. So even go back to that quad stretch. You might go into that stretch and be like, okay, my rectus femoris is trashed. I don't need to like drive my hips forward and focus on that. But I feel like my vastus medialis isn't as developed as I want it to be. And I just didn't get a great pump with whatever I did today. Yeah. You focus on contracting that. Hmm. And you got 60 to 90 seconds to just – just set yourself up where you've got the best mind muscle connection. Yeah. So the stretch can be um, a very targeted stimulus because it's got the load, it's got metabolic stretch or metabolic stress during the stretch to produce muscle growth. Hmm. And the nice thing about it is about stretches, you know, with, with some limitations, you can't go every direction, but you can go into the stretch and like if you get on a decline hammersmith machine, for instance, it's going to be, there's not much you can do. We can drop the seat down maybe to hit more upper pec, but the machine or the exercise itself is going to dictate where the muscle, how the muscle is hit, the activation pattern that's there. Yeah, that makes sense. But you, you can go into those stretches and change the stretch. You're doing a hamstring stretch with, um, with an occlusion on top of it. Maybe you externally rotate a little bit and try to get the biceps femoris, hmm. the lateral hamstring, hmm. and you work on that. So you can literally... Um, Pick the the nature, choose the dictate the nature of the stress that you get with the stretch as you go into the stretch and find out what you need to do or decide what you need to do in terms of getting the whole muscle hit that day or reemphasizing something you maybe not didn't didn't um, stress as much as you wanted to yeah. with the exercises of that day. Huh. So that's what I have people do, but that's only after you've trained the muscle. Mm. Because that aggressive stretching beforehand will very, very likely impair performance. Okay. Yeah, that makes um, sense. It's a, and it's yeah. a brutal stretch. You know, the stretches that I've done, like the DC style stretches, they're they're not easy, man. And you, I mean, you, I have to, 
I have to have like a clock there to look at. Oh it. yeah. Because otherwise, if I try to do it for like whatever thirty seconds, I'll be like fifteen seconds in it. I'll be like, "This has got to be over by now." And I look at the clock. Yeah. I'm like, Oh my god, I'm only halfway. Yeah. You know, or I'm only ten seconds in. It's like you, yeah. you, you will cut it short. You know, if if you're not actually like timing it. Yeah, I set the I set a timer on my on my watch. Yeah. You know, I've got loaned for like a, a minute and forty five seconds. Okay. So it gives me fifteen seconds to get set up, and then I know I've got at least ninety seconds. So okay. if I'm going to do a ninety second stretch, Whew. and that's a lot, and, man. Ninety seconds. You're going to be oh, they're brutal. You're going to be feeling yeah. that, you know. They're. I mean, it's like they're hard as shit. They're hard as absolute hell. That's why people would just blow them off because oh. they're so difficult. Okay. Um. And but it teaches pain tolerance, I think, mm. too. Okay. Um. That's a any any set that lasts ninety seconds. Yeah is a difficult that's like a widow maker type of set yeah you know yeah so so yeah you can create a, a better stimulus with that someone asked about um uh how did she word it here this was sally Kellaway. thank you for the um help in fleshing out the question as she said um active stretching so that's sort of like i'm gonna toss that into like you know stretching in the way we just talked about with with maybe some uh tension there where someone is or, or even moving around, like you can have, like someone could stretch your hamstring for you, do a little bit of bouncing or almost um, like squatting down. Like one thing that people will do, and this sort of blends together with mobility work. Okay. A good idea for some people when they, if they're going to squat, and you were, you've been talking about squatting deep a lot lately, uh-huh. is like get down into that, that low squat position okay. and just um ease your way down there maybe by bouncing around a little bit and mm-hmm. getting getting connected with the muscles and activating them in the way you want in that deep deep squatting position sure so but that kind of stretching um like in plyometrics too which sometimes can be considered stretching if you're going allowing the, a, a deep stretch to happen those will dampen the myotatic stretch reflex mm. um which can impair performance so the thing and here's the thing like this hasn't this is just like a general recommendation if if you're going to create if i had to choose one or the other the stretch as the stimulus for growth or resistance exercise i'm going to take the resistance exercise sure so i want that i wanted that to be as as uh pure of a stimulus as it can be and if i went after it with the stretching aggressively first and foremost yeah before the resistance, that's the chances are you're going to impair what you can do there either just because you're getting psychologically fatigued mm. or um like literally you're using up glycogen as well like if you're in a pre-contest situation yeah. um you're gonna you're gonna create some uh um glycogen use and potentially run low on fuel especially if someone's mm. doing a, a high volume type of thing so you'll end up having a lot of junk volume at the end okay um whereas here's the thing um we know from the blood flow restriction literature that you can use very light loads with blood flow restriction. So it amplify that metabolic stress and get growth where you otherwise wouldn't with like really, really low loads. Okay. Although you can take those low loads to failure and still get growth. But the metabolic stress is important. So if you, if you go and train first and you've gotten a pump yeah. and you've produced the metabolic stress and you don't wait around for 20 minutes. Yeah. You literally finish your set, clean up your work area, wherever it is, and then go to your stress, go to your stretch. You still got metabolic stress in place. Hmm. So it means that you're going to have a greater relative metabolic stress component yeah. during that stretch hmm. where and you won't need to have a whole bunch of weight. Okay. Yeah. And that's the big caveat. And like Dante told me of a few, t- I haven't had anyone um, do this because I'm, I'm really pretty careful um and not that dante wasn't but just people would just be knuckleheads he had some guy like who literally i think maybe even threatened to sue him or something like that because he was he was doing like you know peck stretches with the 200 pound dumbbells or some shit shit. like that and he hurt himself like he he was using heavier what's that i bet he hurt himself yeah it was just and like you know just stretching like to the when the joints are hurting and like it's like way overkill just stupidness so if you want the tension, you want the metabolic stress, low tension will still get the job done. Yeah. Um, especially, you know, you, if you're doing the stretch and you've just got done beating the shit out, let's say you just train legs yeah. and you're just like, you know, you're, you're just barely with it anyway, you know, because you just destroyed yourself. You don't want to like be going and 
getting deep into a stretch, let's say it's a hamstring stretch, for instance, where you'll have a tendency to hold your breath because you don't have the cadence or the rhythm of the reps. Okay. You hold your breath and you end up passing out or something stupid like that. Yeah. Because you're trying to do the stretch with, you know, 405 pounds on a mm. stiff-legged deadlift. Yeah. You don't need that if you've already done, you know, hamstring work and all your leg work beforehand. Huh. So you can go lighter on the stretch and still get the benefit. And that's just, it's just better for your joints. Yeah. Two, um, you never want to stretch beyond the normal range of motion of the joint. Like, you know, don't, that's what people were doing is like, you know, trying to like hyper, they were hyperextending their mm. knees. This one guy was hyperextending his knees. Oh, man, stupid that doesn't shit, you know, yeah, yeah, totally unnecessary. But I think it's important you, t- you, you tell us that because I feel like people, people will think, well, more stretch. Yeah. Go beyond that normal range. You know what I mean? Go beyond your, your yeah. limits. You know, because that might be good. I could see making that mistake myself. So, and the thing is, I mean, like you want my, you want a voice of reason resonating, especially if you're like in the zone. Yeah, and you're like, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna stretch the fuck out of this thing, man. I'm going for it. Fuck it, throw another plate on there. And, yeah, and you go in and you do something stupid. You know, it's better to, it's better to like kind of. You know, this is gonna be plenty hard if I just use one plate right. with 135 pounds. I don't need to use 315 for the stiff-legged deadlift. Huh. And so I, want, um, I wanted to throw in, too, for anybody who is yeah. watching this that isn't familiar with Dr. Scott, that uh, you know he's referencing, you're referencing your fortitude training, which yeah. we do have links in the description. That's his training plan. You can get the ebook for like 20 bucks, I believe it is. So mm-hmm. I'd say uh, if you want to learn more about it, definitely check that out. And that's kind of, you've evolved from having been involved with DC training for a long time, where, where there was a lot of you know active stretches going on with that um so just to kind of seat that for anybody who isn't familiar with you or or what you're talking about when you're talking about the stretch component of of fortitude yeah it's a way to auto regulate the training too so um that's why i have have one stretch is just like a it's just like a static a flex i call it a flexibility stretch okay so it's just not a bad idea just to like kind of test out the full range of motion of the muscle oh, and the joints yeah. involved. So like 20 second stretch, just sort of, sometimes you'll like, you'll find out like, oh shit, I kind of tweaked myself on that. I would, I didn't know oh. that I finished my last set and I'm like, yeah. okay, I'm gonna have to pay attention to that. Like, you know, maybe there's something I should do, huh. you know, because you know, you, you did, if you hadn't done the stretch, you wouldn't have even noticed it until maybe the next day or what have you when you've already got an inflammatory process that's sort of running amok if you, if you're someone wants to do that. Okay. I said, somebody said my volume was a little bit low. I'm, I'm not sure. Okay. They said your volume is low, Scott. Ah, so that I helps. Know. I don't know, <laughs> McNally. All right, thanks, man. I appreciate okay. it. I'll try to bring it up a little bit here. Um, yeah, the thing with the let me say too with the DC, DC had just the extreme stretch. Guys. Yeah, and and I but I included the the occlusion stretch as an idea because some like doing like an extreme stretch like for your quads. Um, it, it like where you where you, the, by definition you have to use a weight. Yeah isn't always like the it's not the best way to stretch the quads you're not gonna you're not gonna easily get like that stretch in the rectus femoris okay with any and unless you do like i mean you could like try to do that like while holding a dumbbell or something but it just like doesn't make any sense yeah and it's also a way to like like i said fine-tune the stimulus of the stretch mm. so I, I remember and this isn't a critique of dc this program is absolutely awesome um but there have been times when you can do like the pec stretch with the, like a pec fly machine or dumbbells. You could even do it on a, with a, a barbell or a Smith machine too, but you might not get the same range of motion. Yeah. But there have been times like you, you go into that, I would go into that stretch and I'm like, oh, sh-, it's like one of this, like this is a little bit too much. Okay. Like the, this is like the, the pain of going to the stretch, it's immediately sharp. Like this is probably not what I need to be doing today. So... Oh. But I can do. I can still do a, a really sort of um, intensive stretch by doing an occlusion stretch, where I change the angle and find the angle where I don't have sharp pain in my pec, mm. and and you contract as hard as what feels normal for you. So you could it could be all out like gut wrenching from the get go, you know, like you're like you're giving birth, like you're having an exorcism, yeah. something like that, you know. Or it can be just okay. I'm going to just create a little tension here in this at this angle because this is where I feel I need it. Or I don't need to be stretched. I'm just going to do a, like a flexibility stretch, 20, 30, 40 seconds, okay. and that's plenty. So if he's sitting at his desk, just mild stretches, stuff like that. That's that's not going to be a problem. That's not going to. Well, it sounds like that's what you're telling me. That's not going to affect his gains whatsoever. 
No. In fact, in fact, you know, I, I have found if I don't sometimes not doing some of that stretching that I typically try to remember, remember to do, I, I come back. What's that? I got to start stretching now. Oh, <laughs> we all do. Yeah. Pretty much too much true for anyone, unless you're like a yoga instructor, yeah. you know, but um, then I, I, I sometimes I, I don't I'm not as sore. Really? So, yeah. Or I'm more I'm more sore when I don't do the stretching so if i do the stretching the soreness is a little bit less so it's as that's just an end of one but um you know it, it may be something to do too with the fact that you know imagine this like imagine you imagine you train chest just once a week okay and that's and that's i'm not saying that that's you know that works well for lots of people yeah or once every five days or what have you and like this, this range of motion, like from here and deeper, where you tend to want to go on a lot of your exercises, you never experienced in that at all during the other, um, you know, four days and 23 hours of the, of the time between your two workouts. Yeah. Not at all. So the, what's that? I mean, that's not probably the best scenario for, you know, you're not even producing any sort of um, passive range of motion. Mm through that through that that amount of stretch on the muscle so i think it's good chest for that reason for this this connected tissue turnover idea yeah. it takes a while too i believe the half-life of collagen is like like 90 days or something like that it probably changes oh wow over time but yeah so it takes a while to that's why you'll see studies that really don't suggest the stretching doesn't change much um about the architecture you'll change you'll see changes in the fascicle um length and angles yeah um but you don't see much and you wouldn't expect you expect that you would even necessarily because it's not like you're you're lengthening the um the bones across which the muscle is connecting like you know if if, uh if you had like a car and you had a rubber band that went from the front tire to the back tire and you stretch that all the time the, the distance between the wheels the frame is still the same right you know, it's not like the, all of a sudden the rubber band's going to become longer, um, but changes in the flexibility is what you want. So yeah. at rest, you wouldn't expect much to happen with flexibility or with um, with length of the muscle because you've, you've still got the same car. You've still got the same length of your bones. Yeah. The distance between the origin and the insertion and the origin are the same. And that's not going to change. So, so. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. The other, other thing, too, the mobility work thing, I, I always do this. People Sometimes people call it, I think, priming okay um i kind of have to and this would probably help brian um i'm guessing because i i feel like i have to sort of stretch out a little bit lightly prime so to speak um the priming is more about sort of activating the nervous system yeah sort of sort of neurological warm-up which involves moving through the range of motion of the exercise or exercises you, you want to do so you're not trying to increase flexibility you're not trying to create a stimulus from muscle growth um, you're not trying to become a yogi or, you know, or, or gain new, new range of motion. You're just using like an unloaded version of the exercise. It could even be like, you know, you could consider priming even like, um, just like leaning against a, a doorway like that and just sort of, uh, sort of moving around in that deep part of the range of motion that you'll use for a press. Okay. Just to sort of get things warmed up neurologically. So that's helpful for me psychologically and plus i just feel like i had this sense that if i were to just not do that that i would just be begging for an injury mm. yeah all right so let's see what else we've got here um right. was there anything that jumped out to you scott on our question thread that you uh you wanted to, uh, to get in today so many um ed kemmeyer's actually he, he he's such a good dude he sends me messages and we interact fairly regularly um is this the so, triathlon yeah. lady? Uh, yeah, yeah. So a lady close to me is training for a triathlon. So her coach has suggested that she should not lose weight while she's training. Okay. But health-wise, the person wants to shed about 10 pounds. Is there a benefit to keeping excess weight on while training for endurance sports like this? Hmm. So he kind of answered his own question by calling it excess weight. Okay. <laughs> because if it's excess, it's not, it's not useful. Huh. Otherwise, it would be excess. Um, so the the for most people being lighter is going to be helpful except that wa the body fat is buoyancy when you're in the water if you're doing a triathlon oh. um 
And it could, you know, like the best like English Channel swimmers. I, I think this still is the case. I don't follow the the world records for swimming swimming in English Channel, but like a lot of those deep sea swims where the water is just like crazy cold. The women are the best at that. Really, okay. they tend to have. Yeah, they they. I think they. I don't know, but for many in many um, cases, women have held the record. Huh. Of, of that over men and you don't see that in like the olympics yeah you don't see that even in i don't think in endurance sports where the water temperature is controlled because you've got an indoor pool uh-huh. or maybe even an outdoor pool in a you know more temperate climate but huh. you get in that cold water and it's good insulation huh, that's interesting. And, and and it's flotation yeah yeah i'll tell you what yeah. man, i used to be a great swimmer when i was a kid i would say oh, yeah. that like swimming was my number one skill in life yeah, well, oh, you know, of, among other things that I was good at, but swimming was like I really excelled, and I huh. had the opportunity to, you know, do a lot of really cool stuff in the water. By the time that oh, I yeah. was fifteen, I became certified with scuba diving, did a lot of snorkeling, and um, anytime I'd ever been to like the Caribbean and we were snorkeling and swimming, uh, you, like we would see the guys that would you know go like dive seventy feet down and go through the caverns and come oh, up the, the other side. Divers. And yeah. I could do all that. Like, I was really good at this, man. And I'd just be in the water swimming for hours. And then I stopped. I stopped swimming. You know, there's no real lakes if you don't go out and search them out. I don't live on a lake, for instance, you know. Um, right. Stayed here in Detroit, kept lifting weights, worked, lift weights, worked, lift weights, never went swimming. And then finally, I decided uh, three, four years ago, four years ago, maybe now, I went to Belize. And I ended up in a river. We had we were going to this cave exploration thing. Crossing this river, huh. I was like, oh, yeah, I've swam all my life. And the water was high to, due to a lot of rain. Scott, I almost drowned. Like, oh, shit. Yeah, it was normally like you could walk through the river. But due to uh, the high waters, you had to swim. And so I had uh-huh. a backpack with me, and we're fully clothed. I've got shoes on and stuff. And they're like, yeah, just there's a rope that goes across and they're like just hold on to the rope and you can just swim across with it man i sunk like a rock scott and and then i've realized since i've tried man i (laughs) can't swim my yeah my i have no ability to float like i i I just have to paddle and paddle to hold myself up and the second i stop man i go back under so it's yeah it it definitely there's something to be said man because i used to be such a good swimmer and now man i'm kind of scared to go in water over my head Ah, uh, fuck that! You need to get in a pool or something. I have, dude. Like, I mean, I've tried, too. but really, yeah, what I mean is, is like, yeah, I guess what I mean is like, I'm scared because it's kind of like I, I have no ability to save myself. That's it's not like a, it's not like I have yeah. a, a phobia. It's just uh-huh. like fuck. There's nothing I can do. You know, it's it's yeah. It's I, be, I bet you could. I bet you could. I mean, like you swim like so you swim like Rocky in uh, in I don't know which movie it was where they had him swimming. I don't know. I don't. I don't remember him swimming. Oh, he was just like slapping the water. You know, I'm a good swimmer. It may have been I mean, Rocky Three. I can't remember. I'm a good swimmer. I mean, I took classes yeah. all the time when I was a kid, and uh, uh-huh. I was like all but a certified lifeguard. You know, I'm an open water scuba yeah. diver. Like I said, did I, you swim competitively, like like on the swim team, that kind of thing? No, no, I didn't on the oh, swim okay. team. But what I mean though is, like, I know how to swim. But the second mm. that I stop, there's no floating. I just boom. I go down. Oh yeah, yeah. It's it's crazy, yeah. man. I've talked to other people that are into lifting weights. The same thing. It's just there's like zero flotation. So yeah, yeah. There's de- I was captain of my high school swim team. Were you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. But I don't. I I still. I mean, I sink more now, but I don't have any problem swimming. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just. I mean, I can tell the difference because I'm. You know, I was you know 160 pounds or something like that. Yeah, you know, yeah. then. Yeah. And um and now you know I'm a little heavier. <laughs> Yeah, and a lot of it's muscle. So I, I'm taking but, uh, us a little bit off topic there, but I had to throw my story in about swimming since you were talking. You know about that it. there's an interesting topic that you sort of brought up that mm-hmm. was that I've seen people. It's been popping up on YouTube, and it's probably because did you see the um, the Joe Rogan interview with Ronnie Coleman? Not yet. I have to listen to it this okay. week before bodybuilding. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty good. It's Ronnie. You know. Yeah. It's just like amazing. Like you know the thing that I pieced together. This is sort of getting us further uh, astray, but. I had the sense, and I sort of had this before, that he had some back issues. He had a right. back injury when he was a kid that I didn't know that he had, oh. he had hurt his back earlier, and then it happened again in college maybe. I had the sense that a lot of his back injuries were were due to a botched surgery oh. or – or maybe maybe the just the fact that he just kept on he had the one injury and then the surgery wasn't adequate for taking care of 
of the, the initial disc injury, yeah. but they just kept on adding and adding and adding shit. And that like, it wasn't it, like what we see now in terms of like all the, all the uh, hardware in his spine. Yeah. That m- probably because Ronnie's not a complainer mm. and, and, I'll, and it also it seems like, I mean, he hasn't taken upon himself that I could tell cause he doesn't know the terminology. He doesn't know what the procedures were. You, know, you talk to some people, and it's like, yeah, I had, you know, I had an endoscopic disectomy at L four and L five, and you know, they did, you know, a laminectomy at the, and they 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 know what you know the doctors call this stuff yeah. because they've had it done, and they want to. Ronnie didn't; he couldn't remember what some of the things were, and some of it's because so much of it. But I have a feeling that is, and I and, and I don't want to get like sued here, but I have a feeling that like some uh, some of it was like s- surgical issues that uh. that um, and maybe who knows that he did so much, but I. I've always thought like it was just he just destroyed his spine, yeah. You know, with all the lifting, but he had a pre-existing injury, which is one thing. And then it seems like he had some surgeries that definitely like there's always a, some percentage, so it may, it may have nothing to do with the uh, proficiency of his surgeon. But like they just he just got like bad had bad luck again and again and again. It sort of uh, sort of avalanched in that way, snowballed, huh. so to speak. But. But the one thing he says, and people are like, oh, my God, like, this is bullshit. Oh, yeah, the, he, he says that his, he, you saw this part about I've his body fat pe- percentage. Yeah, well, go ahead and tell us. Yeah, get, well, I, I figure we can, we can address it because you're talking about how people weighing more underwater when they lifted. So, yeah, yeah he, he was they, the, the number that, that was spat out when he did hydrostatic weighing, that's underwater weighing in the weigh tank, yeah. was at one point like 0.33%. Yeah. And he said he never got above like three percent when they would do, I think, calipers. Okay, um, at, with the police department. And one time he mentioned this. First he said the point three, and then he said it was also like negative. I think he, maybe he said negative two percent. Okay. So that 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 is an error in the underlying assumptions that are the basis of that those equations. Huh. So I don't know exactly what he had done. There's different ways you can do this, but so. Uh, this is kind of it's a good topic for people to understand because people like the body fat thing yeah i've written an article on john meadow's site people can go and look into this so okay. for the longest time before dexa came around you can actually use mre mri and cat scans too to do body comp really um but dexa is a, is an easier one people would use underwater weighing huh. and it's based on archimedes principle so um that uh the amount of fluid or water in this case that's displaced represents the volume and you can so you can figure out how much fluids displaced that way so i think archimedes supposedly had this this he recognized this was kind of like the equivalent of new of the apple falling on newton's head mm-hmm. archimedes got into the bathtub and when he like i think maybe i'm totally making this up but maybe that just heard this explanation given but you get in the bathtub and the water overflowed yeah. it's because his volume of his body displaced x amount of water you could actually measure that. People may have done this in their science classes in high school or something like that. And if you weigh something and you figure out how much water it's displaced, mm-hmm. mass over volume gives you density. Huh. So the underlying assumption of underwater weighing is that the density of the body fat is 0.9. The density of water is 1 okay. at 12 to 13 degrees Celsius or something like that. Changes upon temperature. And the density of the fat-free mass, so you've got fat and everything else yeah the fat free mass is 1.1 1. 1. okay and so that's the underlying principle underlying idea and uh when you go when you take someone and you weigh them on dry land and then you weigh them underwater mm-hmm. you can figure out you get the amount of buoyancy that they have it'll tell you what their density is and then if you make the assumption that it's the only fat and fat free mass you can sort of say well if the fat's this dense and the fat free mass is this dense and this is how much they weigh underwater yeah this is how much fat they are and this is how much fat free mass they are okay but the assumption about fat is pretty close although it's not always true it's the one about fat free mass can be all over the place so like for instance the um the density of skeletal muscle tissue i believe is 1.06 all right the density of bone is 1.34 huh and there are quote unquote racial differences in the density of the fat free mass. So there are some equations where they where they modified equations where they look at um, they uh, if the person's black or African American, however they categorize them, they presume a different because they've you can you can figure this out in other ways. 
the different density huh. of that fat-free mass. No kidding. So you take someone like Ronnie Coleman, and here's the other thing is that, that those numbers were plugged in. There's two main equations. There's one called the Siri. People can look this up if they want. Siri and the Brozek equations. And the Siri equation was a way to take that underwater wing information and convert that based on what they found in cadavers. Hmm. And so it was, the assumption then was that you can take anybody and those, it was six male cadavers is representative of pretty much anybody you put in the dunk, dunk tank. Well, those six cadavers were like average sized people. There's only six of them, six people to create this Siri equation. I think the Brozek was similar to that. Okay. And none of those people were 330-pound bodybuilders or 295-pound bodybuilders look like Ronnie Coleman. Yeah. So the underlying assumptions of, bot- of the density, um, which differs by race, which I hate that word, we're all the human race, but that's kind of what you, how you have to say it, um, and especially someone who carries that much muscle mass is so friggin' far off. Okay. That you can end up, if you just apply these equations, which don't really fit Ronnie Coleman, yeah. you throw them in the dunk tank. There's also an equation that they may or may not have measured how much the volume of air in his lungs. Okay. So you can measure, you can't measure that directly. It's not like you can like take a, like a shop vac and empty someone's lungs of the air and figure out how much volume it is. Right. They'll have to do shit like use oxygen or nitrogen and have them breathe in and out. And see how much it dilutes, based, and that will tell you what the volume is. Yeah. So if it's if it's a large volume, it will dilute to a different concentration. Whether it's a small volume, your lungs, or you can just base it on the size that varies. So there's all these assumptions that are just like all over the place. If you're confused, it's like yes, because it's very confusing. The shitload of assumptions. You put someone like Ronnie Coleman, who basically violates the assumptions every which way to Sunday. And yeah, you can get a number that's 0.33 percent, which obviously is is physiologic, physically impossible. Yeah, just just because your cell your, your cell membranes are all made of phospholipids, okay. they're mostly fat. You have essential fat is considered to be like four percent of your body fat. So can you Something sum like that back up in a really simple way? That because sure. I'm kind of with you, but I I, yeah. I I I would love to hear it restated. I could I could tell you what your body fat percentage is, but in order to do that, I'd have to kill you. So instead, they use the dunk tank to figure out what your density is, which can give you an estimation of your body fat percentage. But there's a whole boatload of assumptions that are underlie that 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 equation, that calculation, which yeah. is just an estimation, which Ronnie Coleman is an obvious exception to. He's an exception to almost everything you can think of yeah. when it comes to physics. The guy never gets sick. Like he literally said that on the Joe Rogan show. It's like, it's like, so, you know, like he's like, Oh, I don't, Roddy's like, I don't get sick. And Joe's like, what do you, I like how you said it. It's like, no, I've only been sick like two or three times my entire life. Huh. He just doesn't get sick because he's got like this alien immune system, you know, yeah. it's like Superman. So, so anyway, there is actually, and I posted this on my Instagram. We may have even talked about it here before, but I did, um, a DEXA a long ago when I was in grad school. You remember this? I Yeah, I remember the conversation. Yeah, I did one recently, and that was like for one of my shows last year, and it put me at... It was like eight or I, something? Was that the one? No, that was like off-season one, I think. That okay. was quote-unquote off-season. That was like four or something, four or six. On DEXA, okay. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. I, I and remember this, when... I was going to say, I remember when you did one a while, this is some time ago, like back when Jordan was even on the show still, and that it said you were like seven or eight, but I would have guessed you were like four if you asked me by the way you looked. You yeah. Would, your, your thing was to say, hey, guys, this is what a real 7% looks like. And like you look like body, you look stage ready, you know? Yeah. Well, I was, I was, uh, uh, there's a video I posted from the gym with okay. this other one that I did when I was. It was like really close to a show. It was, was like the week of a show. That was more recently. Yeah, that was like yeah. a year ago or something. But I did. But I did one when I was in grad school. We had a body comp lab. Okay. One of the um, uh, Kirk Curitan, who was the department head for a while, he body comp was one of his major areas of research interest. So yeah, he had all the stuff there. They tested out bioelectrical impedance machines for people, like you know, industry uh, research work. Huh. And um, they had access. We had a there's a DEXA across campus in the nutrition department that, that he would go to, and they would test people. So we did underwater wing, we did DEXA, we did skin folds. Skin folds actually, well, here's skin folds as an aside. Skin folds estimate what your body density would be if you got an estimate going underwater. 
Huh. So the skin folds are an estimate of an estimate. Wow. So they can be way the fuck off. Yeah. Yeah. So none of them, they're all indirect. But the, so we did all those. We did bod pod. This was really funny. Oh, yeah. This is when the bod pod first came out. And they've since changed. They don't tell you these are propri- this is proprietary industry information. So we used, I think it was, um, I think it was a Hologic. There's Lunar, there's Hologic, and there's one other brand name I can't remember for the Dexa, like three brands. And they won't tell you what their underlying calculations are. Huh. They go and and like this like this Siri equation that is used for like the Dernan Wamersley and the Jackson and Pollock equations. People who People who have studied exercise science will know exactly what I mean. Or people who do a lot of skin folds, they probably use the Jackson Pollock equations. Hmm. Um, those are all based on some uh, original sample, which is kind of representative of your average person. But they don't have extremes like Ronnie Coleman yeah. in the sample. So they make huge errors. And you go like the bod pod, they wouldn't tell you like exactly what they're doing. The bod pod actually just gives you an estimate of body density. Hmm. And then applies the Siri equation to Brozek, or at least that's how they used to do it. Okay. It was just another way. It's called air plethysmography. It's just another way to get body density, <laughs> which is really funny. So it's really not any better, although it looks cool. Yeah. You look like you're, you know, Robin Williams coming out <laughs> from space. It's Mort from Orc, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's just all, all, all they do is there's like a little membrane in the back of that thing that moves. Like you mm-hmm. can hear it kind of move around. Mm-hmm. And, and it measures the extent to which the air compresses yeah. when it's empty versus when you're in there. And if you're in there, you're taking up some space. So you move that membrane a certain amount. And with less volume uh, occupied in the rest of the cavity, it changes the amount of pressure that you change that you find. The bigger you are, the more the change, the smaller you are, the less you change. So just measure your volume, you weigh yourself on the scale, you get mass, you get volume, you get density, and then you apply the same equations, same shit. Just don't have to get wet. So anyway, we did the DEXA way back when, this was like, probably like 97 or 98. I have uh, have it someplace. And they, again, like no people of extreme um, body comp and I did this two weeks after my very first show okay and I knew that we we're gonna do the body comp lab so it kind of sucked because I finished the show and then I wanted to just eat you know yeah and um, so I kind of kept myself close and we did underwater wing and I was like four percent we did skin folds I was like four percent and um, I think the bioelectrical impedance was all like all I don't remember whether that one was but all the all we did um, actually we did a four component model but and that's a whole other story that we won't bore people with. But the bod pod put me at 16%. Oh. Which was interesting. <laughs> yeah. There was a guy who apparently was like this. He was like, he'd won the Mr. Georgia NPC that year. Uh-huh. So super heavy, like who was going on to compete and hopefully get his pro card at the USA's. And he went in to get his, his body fat done. And they told him he was like 14% or something, something like that. Hopefully he, he didn't have to pay for that. Yeah, like he got his money back. It's like, that's bullshit. Yeah. And they do regional body fat percentage on the DEXA. And so you get left and right leg, and they did torso. And on my torso, I think it was negative 2.4%. Okay. Huh. Negative. Yeah. That's impossible. Yeah. yeah. You can't have that. So it's because, like, Ronnie Coleman's negative 2%. Yeah. It's because, like, that's just impossible. You can't have that. It's because the equations don't fit someone who is that lean or, in his case, that big. Interesting. So, and the machine, it wasn't smart enough to, yeah. to, to, to weed out, like, an impossible number. Like, they just, like, that wasn't something that the, um, you know, the, uh, the, the computer was set up to do and say, well, you know, not an A or something like that, not applicable. Yeah. Um, and it was just because I was so far outside of the, the sample population was from which they come up with those um, equations. I mean, imagine like you think of this like what's a way to estimate someone's IQ, you know, and you ask, um, you know, 100 questions like it's not really not a real IQ test, kind of a generic one. And, and you the people you want to figure out how well your estimation works. Yeah. Their IQs are like from like 80 to 120. Hmm. And. So, and then you come in and you test someone like Einstein. I think he was supposed to be like 160, yeah. you know, or John von Neumann, who was like 200 plus. Well, he like, he, answer, he doesn't even, he just answers all, he gets all of them right. Yeah. He doesn't have an IQ of 120. He has an IQ of 200. So it gives him the wrong number because the people that they used to set up the equations di- weren't representative of those people you're testing. So that makes Ronnie sense. Coleman. There's no. They shouldn't be testing Ronnie underwater. Probably couldn't even test Ronnie. Well, he couldn't fit on the DEXA. They'd have to do a double scan with him, probably. Mm. 
because some, sometimes people are too big. So anyway, that's Im- that's important. So people can maybe pay attention to that because everyone's like they're calling. I think they're like calling Ronnie a liar and this kind of stuff. Like like they're they're claiming that he was ignorant, and I think he knows that you can't have negative percent body fat. He was just telling what the it was sort of making fun of the numbers that they gave him. Okay, you got the that's what you got the vibe of that he was. That's what I thought. Yeah, okay. like yeah. they told me negative and like. Ronnie, I mean, Ronnie's an easygoing guy, and he's not, he's not, he's, he has an accounting degree. He's not an idiot. He knows numbers. Yeah, there you go. And he's not a, yeah. And he's not a, he, he has no reason to fabricate or lie about things either, you know? No. Listen, we so, got a bunch I, of questions that piled up here on the thread ooh. itself. Um, we don't have a lot of time, but there's, I want to jump to a couple of them here because I think right. there's some fun stuff. Um, so, okay. Now, for, for those of you guys that don't know, uh, Scott had actually coached Jordan Peters. How, how long was that period of time for that you worked with Jordan? <sighs> I think we did. We worked together twice because I, I talk with Jordan all the time, so it kind of gets all blurred together. But yeah, I think he did two shows. Okay, he did two shows, and and, and you helped yeah. him to grow as well, right? Like you helped. Yeah, him there was. Yeah, well, there was the off season when he went from like. 218 or something like that to 285 okay so like kind of as big i think i don't know that he how i think i think he'd been like in maybe 250s before that but it was like a big like we had him at like close to 10,000 calories a day for a while and and then we when we dieted down that's when he got his naba pro card okay that might have been like 2016 or something well here's the question um hi guys great show i have a question jordan peter said that he made the biggest gains in his life after he was coached by Scott and Milos. He was using, uh, it says, was he using the four-day-a-week fortitude training split, and what was his diet like to take him over 300 pounds? He, well, I don't, when he was working with Milo, she was doing Milo's training, I believe. Okay. Or maybe not. I don't know. I couldn't picture him doing giant sets. It just doesn't. He, he, I know there's a video of him doing some of those and yeah. maybe he didn't do that. I think maybe he started and then he's like, nah, yeah, I can but see he didn't that. get about, yeah, he didn't. I mean, cause it's just like, it, it's just not going to work for him. He knows that now, but he never got above 300 with me. That was with Milos. Okay. So they're kind of like blending the two together, but we were doing DC training. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. He, this was actually before the book came out. I think pretty sure it was Okay, not 99% sure it was. So we were just doing DC training. Um, I think the two way split, maybe the three way split. I, I can't remember exactly. Yeah. But yeah, let's talk about that. That the, when he went to two, did you say 280, 285? It was 285. I think. 285 from 219. It was something like, yeah, I, I didn't remember. Like, he's posted that because he knew, but yeah. um, I just knew we're going to just get a real good big as fuck, yeah. you know, because he's a fucking machine. He will do the people stuff that, like, um, basically almost no one else would do. Yeah. Which he still demonstrates like, to this day. What do you mean? Give me an example of that. Like, well, like when, did, when did you say to yourself, like, oh, he's different in the way that he'll, in what he's willing to do? Good question. Um, it was the nature of the exchange. I mean, Jordan's a, he's a, you know, outside of the gym where, you know, he's an absolute monster. He, very, very polite, a, a very, he would ask questions and I, in a way that was, that really matched how I like to kind of educate people. Yeah. So I would, you know, sometimes ask rhetorical questions to him to get him thinking, but he was always asking about things. So we, we had a really good working relationship where, um, you know, I I was, and that was the time too. I was refining some of the things I do, like you know, which meal do you think you could add this food to? Because we had to, uh-huh. because I couldn't just say, okay, like let's add some food in this in meal six. It was because he's already at seven thousand calories. Holy cow! You know, wow, that's a yeah. Lot he was up. We I think we went up close to ten thousand calories. Wow, a day with him. So he, you know, I would I'd have to. I, he was both willing to to do whatever. Yeah. But also very, um, very good with giving me feedback as to what was going on. So okay. sometimes you'll have people who don't want to come across as complainers. And as clients, you probably have run into this. And then they don't tell you shit that's going on. And then, like, next thing you know, they've got all sorts of GI distress and, like, yeah. they can't sleep at night. And you're like, I need to know this stuff. Like, yeah. When did you know, this start? 
Yeah, I'm not. We're not here to like see how long you can go without uttering a peep. Yeah, you know the idea is we want to work with your body as much as possible because this is a delicate process. Okay, as as much as you're forcing something, it is still a delicate process. Yeah, on the other side of the coin. So, um, and Jordan was just absolutely dead set that he's going to beat the logbook every time he went in the gym, huh. which he still is. Yeah, you know he's still like a lot of those like all this all the sort of things that we were doing are are things that he I mean, he he knew. We learned these are things that, you know, I had come to know and that, you know, Dante had professed and that's, you know, that's, and I had been doing DC training for a while too hmm. and seeing how, I, for most of the time, I think I was getting the emails that Dante would send the day after a while I didn't need to, but, um, so I was, I was privy to how Dante did things yeah. and I was, I knew what worked for me and, and Jordan came to learn and the evidence showed that when you go from two, when you gain 65 pounds, in nine months or however long it was, and and so, so much it, so much of it is muscle and size, that that is a functioning formula for you. Yeah, no kidding, so, man. And he was willing to do that. He like oh. he he like he trusted me. Yeah. Um, and so it was just like all of the everything was lined up exactly as you would want it to be. Hmm. So all, his check ins were always you know dead on. You know everything was just he was just uh, immaculate. Hmm. And all of those things, and but not everyone could could do what he's willing to do. Hmm. Most people, ten thousand calories, like some people could couldn't do that just once. Yeah. And he had to work his way up, and it was like, I mean, he'd get anxious before meals. Yeah, he's talked about this, I think, before. Okay, and I've been there too, you know. And he'd have, you know, I, there have been times when I've been pushing the food when I'd like I'd been in bed for three or four hours and I throw up. Mm. Like I'd wake up with vomit in my mouth because I just like. I had so much food in my belly from the day's worth of food. I'm like, damn it. Like, it's the worst feeling. All of a sudden, you've got a mouthful of vomit. And you're like, well, I probably should you know, carry this to the bathroom, Ugh. you know, because you're just pushing everything. But you learn, okay, now I need to take some digestive enzymes in, yeah. you know, before yeah. I go to bed or what have you. So it was just, um, it was somewhat. And, it, and Jordan, he doesn't have, like, premier, like, Flex Wheeler, Ronnie Coleman type genetics. Yeah. If he did, he wouldn't have had to do what we did mm, you know yeah but he does have uh, genetics of the right mindset mm. and he has the ability to, to push in a way that that some people won't and that's really um and but he has got good genetics to respond to that too yeah yeah that's that's you know? got to be true too i'm sure yeah yeah so and he's a hardy i mean he's a hardy guy like the things he pushes himself through mm. although he did push himself too far and he, he documented this on his on his discussion board this last, I think it was all in 2019, maybe part of the year, but he, and I, we talked about it a good bit because I've done the same thing. Like he pushed himself to the point of like this sort of, um, it's like a systemic inflammatory syndrome as well. I'll just, I'll just give it a name right now. I just came up with that where you're just fucking achy everywhere. Like everything fucking hurts all the time yeah. constantly. And it's cause you just trained so hard and pushed so far so much food and he had to he had to stop training. Like he's there's lots of videos and and you can look on his Instagram where he just went to the gym with Corin to help her. Wow. And normally they would train together. Yeah. So like he's got he had that willingness to kind of push way beyond what most people would do yeah. and the ability to adapt to that. Yeah, to a place so. most people would never would never go to. And yeah, yeah, and I I could see that the ability to yeah. adapt to it. All right, yeah. let's see what else do we have here. If they, if I can throw anything else out that uh, uh, would be interesting, um, let's see. There's a question about. Um, okay, here's one that I think would be interesting to tackle, Scott. Um, uh huh. Just give me your th your thoughts overall on this one. Uh, where would you recommend grip width on behind the neck presses for best delt activation and least tricep activation? Behind the neck presses. Uh, well, <laughs> the first thing to consider there is whether you should be doing behind the neck presses. I was wondering where you were going to go. That's why that's in the first place. <laughs> so those work great for some people who have the flexibility yeah. to do that. They work phenomenally well. And um, I knew a guy in um, in grad school. Actually, he I think he's a strength coach at one of the Texas one of the schools in the University of Texas system. Yeah. And um, 
really, really cool guy. And, and I, I spent a year working down at the New House Royal Complex in UT Austin um, with my buddies who were all, they were all GAs. I was just doing the regular thing, but I got to do an internship down there for a while. And so we trained every once in a while. I'd spot him and he would do, he was like maybe 200 pounds, pretty lean. He was like, he was 45 or 50. We used to, you know, we used to call, just laughed about how old he was, okay. but he kept his shoulders really flexible and healthy. Huh. And he would do sets of two and a quarter behind the neck press all the way down to his traps no kidding. for sets of 10. Wow. But he had the flexibility to do that. Yeah. So biomechanically speaking, obviously the closer you come in together, the more triceps you're going to use. The further out you go, um, the less triceps are going to be involved. Mm -hmm. Some of that's just, it's just the, the mechanics of it. It's the angle through which the elbow is going during the course of the range of motion. You start here and you go all the way down, like imagine it's behind the neck, but you've got a lot, you've basically full excursion at the elbow. Whereas you start here and go all the Mm -hmm. way down. You've got a shorter range of motion in terms of what the bar does, but you only get half of the, the change. Yeah. So you can figure out what that means in terms of workload that has to be carried, so to speak, by the elbow extensors, the triceps. Yeah. So so that's the other thing. I don't – most people probably going – anything with the bar going below like the top or maybe the middle of your ears is probably not the best idea. Okay. So – but this is just a matter of feel. Probably, if you if you can do those and get away with them and go behind the neck without like crank your neck forward, then yeah. you know, um, just literally, literally, so that you're just about close to ninety at the elbow uh-huh. when you're at that at that height with the bar behind yeah. your neck yeah. at your head. So here, you go too far here, this becomes triceps. You go too far there, and then your range of motion is just so shitty. You know, you're not you're not getting a full you're not getting a great range of motion. Not that you can't grow that way, mm-hmm. but you ever see how um, Marcus Rule used to do chest presses? I don't remember offhand. Yeah, I think it's um like the Made in Germany video, but he used to go super, super, super wide. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, and he would also he would also arch. He also kind of like did he did a this sort of an arch in his upper back a little bit, but he'd allow his scapula to come down uh-huh. a little, uh, just to sort of it, it, it was it made some of it a serratus anterior and a you know not so much a, a a pec exercise per se, but increase the range of motion when he had this really really super wide grip. No kidding. He was also using like five plates, you know, oh, for sets down or whatever. He's strong as of shit. Of course he was, yeah. And, and he had an awesome chest until he finally he started to tear it a little bit there yeah. at the end. Okay. Started to separate from his sternum. But so not that you can't do that so much with with the um with an overhead press, yeah. but you can go you can go wide. But the main thing with that ex- like that that's one of those exercises where if you're lucky enough that you can still do it without like messing up your shoulders, yeah. then pick the hand position that feels the most comfortable for you um, as long as you feel like you're getting what you need from the, 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 del- the delts, the anterior delts are the weak link in the, in the exercise. Yeah. So this is a good, just standard place to start. This obviously ends up being, you can actually do, I, I do these as a tricep exercise. It's a, it's actually sort of a DC related strategy. You can do close grip overhead presses. Okay. Yeah. So let's say like the thing people will talk about is like, let's say you want more chest work in a DC training split where you're training frequently and you don't have a lot of exercises you're doing. Yeah. So for your triceps work, you would use a close grip chest press. Okay. Because you get a little bit of extra chest work that way. Yeah. Well, you can accomplish that same thing, whether it's DC or fortitude training or any sort of kind of abbreviated high frequency, lower volume type of approach. If you want to get more delt work, but you're doing it as primarily tricep exercise, go close. Overhead tricep, hmm. close grip tricep on a Smith machine usually feels best. Okay. Those are great. Yeah. So you could even do hex presses that way too, but you want to not not um, hit yourself in the head with a dumbbell. I've done that with triceps before like that. Yeah. Those are good. Yeah. Those are good. That actually feels pretty good too. It's an, Yeah. It's a nice stretch. Yeah. Um, let's see. I'll get I'll grab one more here. Um, All right. This is from uh, uh, I once again I can't remember how to say his name. I, I don't know. C- Cigan. I, I can't even. See I think the thread it's, here. So. I think it's Cigan. Cigan Dairy, the guy who I mentioned at the beginning of the show. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, I currently take uh, several adaptogens, and they're in powder form, as they are much cheaper. But it's getting annoying to spoon feed three of these to myself several times a day. 
Uh, is there an inert liquid solution that I could use that I could add to this, um, such as alcohol that won't damage or alter the supplements? If they're just in powdered bags, I would just um, mix them all together in the right proportions. Okay. You know, like let's say it's two two tablespoons of one and one and one of the other. Right. You know, just take um, you take the one the ones that are the one, figure out which is going to be the limiting in terms of what you have at home, and then just combine them all twice of the first one and and one and one of the other. So weigh it out. You know, and then which, what? So let's say it's and that's let's let's it's, it's a tablespoon is what he he does. So there's two one and one. Yeah. So a tablespoon of one is. 10 grams tablespoon of the other two are eight grams so he's basically getting 20 grams and eight grams and eight grams okay so that's that's his ratio is 28 and eight and he's got buying them in one kilo um bottles well then that means he's going to have two kilos of the other one and 0.8 kilos and 0.8 kilos of the other one get a big ass fucking jug like you get from true nutrition if you order something from them maybe uh, or maybe it's just a big like food grade bag they have those too i think he maybe just ordered the bags which just you know something you can store it in and put two kilos of one in there actually probably put like a half a kilo and then but then you know, half what, of the other half the other what, what's that then what though because he's asking you then you shake it all up but then what he doesn't want to take powder then, well hold on i'm getting okay. there oh, okay getting okay there. yeah i mean there's two ways i mean the part of the problem i think is that he has to do do it one each time. Like he's got a bunch of them. It okay. could be five things. Like scoop from each bag. So pre well, combine them. You can pre mix them all together. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's why. I mean, that's why people buy all sorts of supplements that are pre made with them. Because it's, it's less. It might work, be work yeah. out, but and it's got all. It's got five ingredients in there. Well, yeah. you buy the five ingredients from True Nutrition. Use the Advices Radio code, which gives you five percent off your purchases, and then you can recombine those in whatever way you want to. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, you can do that. Like a smart way to do that, I have I've had people do this before, not with such large amounts, because it depends on how much he's he's taking these. If it's like just a raw powder and it's big, he doesn't want to use a bunch of alcohol. He's kind of like he'll end up doing like a shot of alcohol <laughs> to get as much in there. Like, in, like he'll end up drunk if he goes to work out. Yeah, maybe maybe before he goes to bed at night. I don't know, but you can also get like an adrenal tonic. Okay. Or yeah, uh, or let's something with like licorice usually, or like a liver, a liver tonic. Huh. Um, if he's using small amounts here, like you know, yeah. a gram or less or something like that of each of these in the powder form, and then you combine those, you can get like like four ounce bottles of like a liver tonic. Let's say he you know takes a liver tonic that's got you know um, silly marin in it, milk thistle or whatever other things, and then he adds that in whatever uh-huh. concentration he wants things to be in. Okay. So then he uses a dropper. So the, the smart way then would be, let's say most droppers are like one mil. Yeah. So let's say he's got, four, there's about 28 milliliters in an ounce. Yeah. So he's going to have like a, about 112 one milliliter drops. It'll probably say 112 or whatever milliliters on there. So um, he's going to have to do a little math, have to figure this out. But let's say he wants to have. Um, you know, 200 milligrams, 100 milligrams, and 100 milligrams. Uh-huh. So he wants to have 400 milligrams in every mil. Yeah. Well, that's going to take up a certain amount of volume, but he's going to he can figure out given the total volume of the bottle. Yeah. And how much of those he wants to put in there. Pour a little bit out into a bowl or something like that, and then load your powders in, or load the premix powder if you've already done it that way, and put that in there so that you have. Um, if it's a, let's say it's, let's say it's hundred mils, not 112. Yeah. So you'd want to have the equivalent of a hundred doses in that bottle, pour half the stuff out, throw a hundred doses in, make sure that you're not, you're not playing with numbers that are impossible. Like you're trying to yeah. put like massive amount of powder in the bottle. It won't fit. Yeah. And then just add the, um, add the, the liquid back, fill it to the same area, the same volume that it once was. And now you've got, you've got four, oh, you've got a hundred doses in 100 mils so you got one dose per mil there you go yeah. take that shit up each time pull the dropper out put it in your mouth and you're good to go there you go and you got the liver thing going on at the same time yeah why not which you, you might get that want. as a bonus too so yeah okay so you could you could mix it into an existing uh an existing tincture type type yeah compound. the alcohol is best for 
Okay. For getting those things to dissolve a lot of times. Yeah. I've seen Some people, people use, just use Everclear. I was going to say, I've seen, I was just going to say that I was going to say Everclear or even like some things will even work with like a Bacardi 151 that that, that right. can work too, you know, depending, I think on the, on the, the product, how much it is. I think yeah. you know, if, you, if you had a lot, you might need something stronger, but there's some well, options here, for here, you. Here's a, there, well, there's a couple things. There's tr- one, if you go on Amazon where you buy it and like read the, like the comments, like some of that stuff is nasty. Yeah. And I have, I have one, I don't know if I threw the bottle away or not, but it's good. It's a, it's a, it's a liver um, thing and it tastes good. It's just like, not, it's not a bad one to have. Yeah. Um, so you, if you add it to that, then you don't mind doing three drops or whatever. Yeah. Cause it doesn't take Everclear and Bacardi one. It's like shit. It's going to be a, <laughs> yeah, it's going to be potent. Everclear's nasty by itself. It's fucking horrible. I know the, the um, research chem companies use like a PEG, but that stuff tastes terrible yeah. too. Like just yeah. like battery acid terrible. Right, right. And then, um, but that is available. I- that would be that would be technically an option. That is something you could use. Yeah, and that stuff is you know you can find it. If he's taken all the powder and mixes it together, so like maybe he has like one tablespoon or whatever to use. Yeah, I think I, I don't know if I've told you this trick before, but so. This works with like like have you ever tried pantothenic acid like vitamin B five? No. It helps with acne. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you could take it as the pills and it's fine, but it's really cheap as powder. Okay. And it's just fucking horrible. Yeah. It's just like you should turn. It tastes so bad it should make you into the Hulk yeah. afterwards because like this stuff is just terrible. But you can I so you can get that down if you take fill your mouth with water. And you have to have the right side scoop so you can get in. So your mouth is full of water. Oh, you've told me this trick before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you let it kind of sink into the water, and then you just swallow it all and chase Ooh. it really fast. Yeah. So he could do that, too, if he just mixes the powder and it's <laughs> too much to, you know, to yeah. buy, put in a tincture. You can do it that way. Sometimes yeah. you could just mix shit in with your with a drink, too, that works. Yeah, that could work. You know, like a greens thing. Sure. And it just slam the whole thing. But All right. Well, with that, let's get out of here for another episode of Muscle Minds with Dr. Scott Stevenson. Check out FortitudeTraining.net, BYOBBCoach.com, and of course, check out our great sponsors, uh, TrueNutrition.com, use our code Advices, and uh, check out uh, GetAzoff.com, Advices10. We'll see you guys. Thanks, Scott. Adios.